everyone, I hope you're doing well, and of course Arnie does too. Now in my last video on invasive fish species, I only really scratched the surface, as humans have really made a mess of this planet, not only through deforestation and polluting our oceans, but also introducing species into places where they do not belong. So in today's video I will be going through 5 more of the worst invasive fish species, and if you think you know any fish that should be on this list then let me know down in the comments below. And we'll start off today in the fresh waters of central and southern Africa, as we have the Nile perch. Now in the last video, I went through why the mosquito fish has become such a problem invasive species, and if a small species can cause such a big problem, then there's no telling what one of the largest freshwater fish in the world can do, as a Nile perch can reach a whopping 2 meters long or around 6.7 feet, and a fish of this size can weigh up to 200 kilograms or 440 pounds, and in their native range they are ambush predators, and their prey can be a wide range of creatures, as when they're young they're known to feed on zooplankton and invertebrates, and older specimens tend to feed on other fish and even their own species. And because of this voracious appetite, if they're introduced into an ecosystem where they do not belong, they will soon take over and eat everything else below them in the food chain. And this is exactly what happened in Lake Victoria, as British colonisers introduced the Nile perch into Lake Victoria to try and boost the fishing industry, and this had a massive negative impact on all the beautiful native fish in the lake. And this isn't just any lake, as Lake Victoria is the largest lake in Africa and is even larger than the country of Latvia, and because of its size, it has its own unique ecosystem, which is unlike any other ecosystem anywhere in the world. But initially for the colonisers, it looked like the introduction of the Nile perch was a great success, as Lake Victoria experienced a huge fishing boom in the 1980s and 1990s, resulting in around 500,000 tonnes of Nile perch being caught annually, and this in turn meant that thousands of people were relocating to the shores of the lake. But this fishing industry wasn't just damaging the ecosystem in the lake, as it also contributed to deforestation, as people would chop down trees to get wood to smoke the fish, and Lake Victoria is home to over 600 species of brightly coloured cichlids, and thanks to the Nile perch and overfishing, these numbers have dropped by 90% in the past 50 years. And because of the ecological impact that the Nile perch has had on Lake Victoria, they were put on the IUCN's 100 most invasive species list, but now thanks to overfishing, even the Nile perch's numbers are in decline, so hopefully the ecosystem of this giant lake will balance out in the years to come. For our next fish we'll be heading to the oceans, as we have the lionfish. Now lionfish were originally native to the Indo-Pacific, and there are around 16 species of lionfish alive today, with one of the smallest being the very cute fuzzy dwarf lionfish, and one of the largest being the red lionfish. And the two species I will be focusing on in this video are both the red lionfish and the common lionfish, as these two fish have become a problem invasive species in the West Atlantic, the Caribbean Sea, and the Mediterranean. And the story behind how these fish got into oceans where they do not belong is still quite a mystery, because as all the oceans are connected, they could theoretically make their way to the West Atlantic, although this is very unlikely. But the most believable theory is one that's very common with most invasive species, and it's that people keep them in aquariums, and once they don't want them, or they grow too large, they release them into the wild. And the first invasive lionfish were detected along the Florida coast in the mid-1980s, but this was just the start of the problem, as their populations grew at an astonishing rate. Lionfish tend to inhabit reefs, wrecks, and rocky habitats, and in these areas they are primarily fish eaters, and as they don't grow too large, they primarily feed on small fish or fry of other larger species, and because outside their native range they don't have many predators, they were able to expand without being predated on. And in and around the US, the lionfish are known to feed on prey that would otherwise be eaten by the native snappers and groupers. And if this wasn't bad enough, they are also known to be able to tolerate brackish conditions, and these areas normally house the juveniles and fry of other large predatory fish. And one of the things that makes the lionfish such a prolific predator are its highly specialised pectoral fins, as these can be used to corral fish into smaller groups where they can be picked off one by one. And these strange fins also offer a layer of defence for the lionfish, as its dorsal fins are hiding venomous spines, which may deter some predators. And as the ocean is so wide and vast, getting rid of these invaders is a lot more complicated than if it was in a freshwater ecosystem. And because of this, in 2018, Florida wildlife officials were offering a £5,000 bounty for dead lionfish, and to this day, if you find a lionfish around the waters of the US, you are advised to catch them or kill them, or you can feed them to sharks as you can see in this clip. But to this day it still looks like we're losing the battle, as lionfish is still prevalent in these areas. But for our next species we'll be heading over to the fresh and brackish waters of Europe and Asia, as we have the round goby. Now the round goby was originally native to the Black and Caspian Sea, and in their native range they're known to feed on mollusks, crustaceans, worms, fish eggs and insect larvae. And although they seem very harmless, they've caused a big problem in the Great Lakes of North America. Now this 
This goby species reaches a maximum size of around 25 centimeters or 10 inches, which is quite a respectable size for a goby. But again, the story of how the round goby got into US waters is still a bit of a mystery, but one of the leading theories is that they were brought over from the ballast waters of ships from Europe. As the round goby was first detected in North America in around 1990, and since then they have successfully spread throughout all the five Great Lakes. And although they do not feed on the native species of North America directly, they do eat their fry and their eggs, which can lead to a massive decline in their numbers. And these small gobies don't just have an effect on the game fish by eating their fry and eggs, but they also compete with native fish that are in the same ecological niche as they are, such as the mottled sculpin and the log perch. And if this wasn't enough, researchers also believe that the round goby is linked to outbreaks of botulism E, as this toxin is passed from the zebra mussels to the gobies and eventually the fish-eating birds, resulting in a huge die-off of these species. And to help control the spread of this invasive species, it is illegal to own any live round goby and they cannot be used as bait. And hopefully by doing this, they'll control the spread of the round goby. But for our next species, we'll be heading over to the fresh waters of southeastern Africa, as we have the Mozambique tilapia. Now the Mozambique tilapia can be found in a wild wide range of habitats in Africa, and it normally does so well in these habitats as it's remarkably robust and also a very adaptable fish. As Mozambique tilapia are omnivorous and feed on a wide range of food items, anything from the smallest of foods such as plankton and invertebrates to small fry, vegetation and even rooted plants. And today the Mozambique tilapia is invasive in many countries around the world. And the reason why they were introduced into so many countries is because they have the potential to be quite useful, as they're a very popular fish when it comes to aquaculture, and in recent years they've become very popular when it comes to aquaponics. And if they find their way into the wild and into ecosystems where they don't belong, it can have disastrous consequences, as they outcompete native fish for both food and space, and they're known to change the whole layout of an ecosystem, as they uproot aquatic vegetation and also dig in the substrate to create their nests. And once they've built these nests, the tilapia actively defend their territories, ensuring that their fry make it to adulthood and then eventually completely take over the ecosystem. And the tilapia invasion in the US was one of the reasons why butterfly peacock bass were introduced into South Florida in 1984. But unfortunately today, most of the tilapia's predators can't keep up with how fast this fish is spreading. Before our next species, we'll be heading to the fresh waters of Russia and China as we have the silver carp. Now this large cyprinid is found in many large rivers in China and Russia, and believe it or not, the silver carp is actually threatened in its native range. And this is all thanks to the construction of dams, pollution, and overfishing. And this might be strange for some of you American viewers to hear, as they've become such a big problem in the US. Now silver carp were imported into North America in the 1970s, and this was both to control algae and plankton numbers, and also for use in aquaculture. But these fish either escaped or were released, and have caused a giant ecological and financial disaster. A silver carp are not predatory fish and feed mainly by using their highly adapted gill rakers to filter out small particles, plankton and other microfoods. And as this fish doesn't have a stomach, they're thought to feed more or less constantly. And because of this and their fast growth rate, they easily outcompete native plankton eating fish such as gizzard shad and the already struggling paddlefish. But silver carp also exhibit some very strange behavior as when boats move by along the surface, these carp are known to jump high out of the water, mostly colliding with people and boats. But there are some effective ways of controlling this species, as people are encouraged to catch and eat them, and because of their habit of jumping out of the water, specialised boats have been fitted with nets to help catch them when they jump out of the water. But hopefully with all the tactics in place, the numbers will soon be under control. But that's about it for this video. As I said at the start, if you have any other invasive fish species that you want me to cover in these videos, then let me know down in the comments below, and I'm sure I'll get round to them at some point. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.